1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 30. If you've got that black Bible that we've been giving out to folks, it's on page 902. And we're going to be taking a look at what I've titled this week, God Has Appointed. And we're going to actually start getting into the gifts and what they look like and how they work. Um, so verses 27 through 30 in 1 Corinthians 12, I want to read and then we'll get into the scriptures. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. I tell you what, why don't we back it up? (laughs) And let's start where I need to start where I told you to start. (laughs) This is why we can't have nice things, Rachel. (laughs) You're welcome. One broken clay pot to a room full of broken clay pots. (laughs) Now... You are the body of Christ and individual members of it. That work a little better back there in the booth? <laughs> and God, this is my punishment for picking on cats last week. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating. Now my heart is back where it belongs. It doesn't sound like I'm preaching the same thing from last week. And various kinds of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets. Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? This is God's word and the correct one for this week. Father, as we go forward, help me to keep my mind straight and focused. In Jesus' name, amen. Any pastor who has a fat head who steps in the pulpit, that's what's going to happen. There's no place to hide up here. No berm to jump behind want us really to talk about today as I get refocused here is that essential to the health of the church and the body of believers is the contrib- contribution of each and every one of us that are here. You're going to hear me repeat things over and over again, and it's not because I've lost my mind, although some people would tell you that I have, mostly my kids and maybe my wife at times, but I repeat because it's important for us to understand and remember these things. We need the contribution of each individual in the body as God has gifted and as God has apportioned. And as we come to the end of chapter 12 here, Paul turns from the instruction of the overall unity of the body and the essentialness that that is needed for the health of the body. And he begins to focus on the various gifts that are important as they operate through each individual member that's here. And the list begins here, but it's not an exhaustive list. I've said that before as well. But it is an essential list for us to really get a hold of and understand as we look to see how the body grows together. We find, as I said last week, other lists in Paul's writing, specifically in Romans chapter 12, for example, as well as what we also call the ascension gifts that you find in Ephesians chapter 4. All of those are gifts in the church that need to be functioning and operating. There's also other places throughout the New Testament that we find. We see Peter touch on things in his letters to the churches all around the known world, expressing the need for these things for the overall health of each community as they find themselves set down wherever it is God has put them. So looking at our opening verse this morning here, verse 27, actually verse 27, not 12, Paul says this, now you are what? The body of Christ and individually members of it. So you get a couple things going on there. Paul, once again, is building on the truth that we found in verse 24 of chapter 12, as well as verse 28 that he emphasizes here, where he states that it is God who arranges and God who appoints. It's not up to us. We don't get to pick and choose. Our job is just obedience. 24b says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And then in verse 28, right at the beginning, Paul says that God has appointed in the church. Where is the focus? It's not towards me, it's not towards you. It's from him down to us. That's how we operate in a healthy way. He's reminding the church, as it were, in Corinth, as well as us today as we sit and we listen, to guard ourselves against what I call self-appointment, what I call pridefulness, 
boastfulness and an arrogance which actually turns itself into a dictatorial bullying by pastors when they become the end-all be-all in determining who does what and who doesn't. We have to be careful to fight against that. Be wary. Be wary of people like that. Been listening to the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. I leave that with you to look up. And a lot of this you'll understand. Because you'll find such folks who grow into a place and a position who absolutely do not like to be questioned about anything. Nor do they care one bit to be challenged with regards to their views and their thinking on how things ought to operate. I ever get like that, I've told my elders, sit me down and have a conversation with me. It is an unsafe place to be. I have a particular role here, for sure, but it is not to be the dictator over everything and everyone all the time. It's also very helpful, again, by way of reminder for us to ask ourselves as we walk through these things, who is being glorified in the middle of it all? Who is the center of attention? Who is being edified? Who is built up? Given all this, it's not really surprising that much like the list of gifts that Paul has in Ephesians 4, he starts here in 1 Corinthians 12 with apostles and prophets. Now before we get all sideways here, we're going to walk through this. It's going to be a little bit different than normal, um, whatever that means, just bear with me. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that God has appointed in the church first apostles and second prophets. Why does he do that? One of the primary reasons why he does that is that they are the first layer in the foundation in the building of the church with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone, keeping everything absolutely straight. Anyone who has ever worked with stone at any level understands that as a stonemason makes the corner of a building, if that corner is not straight, if that corner is not true, if it is not exactly as it should be, everything else falls apart and is out of square. That's the picture that Paul is painting here. So when he uses this picture in Ephesians, for example, as much as here in 1 Corinthians, he's reminding them, and just by default, he's reminding us as well of everybody's new position as believers and our standing in Christ. That's where we start. Not where we were, but where he calls us to be. So then, Paul says to the Ephesian church, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of what? Tom, Dick, and Harry? No, on the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. See, the foundation that we build as we gather together has been established in good doctrine and teaching that has been given to us down through the ages by our church fathers, starting with the apostles and the prophets in Jesus' time. And it begins with the absolute truth that this Jesus of Nazareth, whom the Bible talks about, is the risen King and the risen Lord and the chief cornerstone of anything and everything that ought to come out of this pulpit. If we are away from that truth, we have to ask ourselves where we're going. Something to remember when we take a look at Ephesians 4 also is that the gift of the apostle and the gift of the prophet is not the same as the office of the apostle or the office of the prophet. This is where we charismatic people get a little pear-shaped. So just, again, bear with me. We're going to walk through this whole thing. And it is being recorded, so if anyone wants to come back and have a conversation with me, you know my email, and the district office number can be had by Rachel. But this is what Paul tells us in this letter to the Corinthian church. It's established here that the apostles and the prophets that we find in the book of Acts, for example, had to meet certain requirements. Requirements that we cannot meet today, which is why we don't have capital A apostles or capital P prophets running around. It wasn't just as a sent one. Every one of us who love Jesus are sent to go share the gospel. That doesn't make me an apostle. Paul emphasizes these in terms of function as a gift rather than the office which God has called particular people to. You with me so far? Okay, he emphasizes them as a function, of a, as a gift rather than the office. We have to understand then that anyone who is sent 
Anyone who is sent to proclaim the message of Christ, especially to places where it has never been proclaimed, is functioning in an apostolic gifting, as Paul is talking about here. It does not make them an apostle, capital A. It simply means they're functioning in the gift that Paul is talking about here. And this doesn't mean, and we have to be careful here, that this then makes that person, quote, an apostle, like Paul or the 12 apostles, or those others who we see in the book of Acts. Now, why do I say that? Well, because the Bible tells us that. It's not my opinion. One of the requirements that the office needs is found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 22, where Luke specifically records for us that in order to be an apostle, actually hold the office, one must be a witness to his resurrection. In other words, you had to see the living, breathing, resurrected Jesus. So somebody who comes at you and says, I am an apostle, capital A, they're wrong. (laughs) Having a vision of Jesus or having a dream of Jesus is dynamically different than seeing the risen Lord. Much different. So Paul here is trying to work this out for us so there isn't any kind of confusion saying that in function, glorifying God and edifying the body, in function, this gifting of apostolic gifting is for today, for the building up of the body of Christ. All right? That's what the apostolic gifting is about. Missionaries like Jim Elliott, for example, Eric Little from Chariots of Fire fame, Another beautiful one to look at, David Livingston. I could go on and on and on. Elizabeth Elliot. All of these people, so many others, are all examples of people having the apostolic gifting. That's what Paul's talking about. Yet none of them were apostles, and frankly, none of them ever claimed to be apostles because none of them ever saw the risen Jesus. You know, prophets too, as Paul ties in here, we've also learned, is not an office, nor is it a title that is to be declared. I say this with full confidence. When somebody comes to you and tells you, I am a prophet, capital P, we have to be careful. We don't have that title to declare anymore. It is a gift which glorifies God, edifies the body. We're going to hear that a lot glorifies God, edifies the body. And here's the important part of the prophetic gifting. It clarifies his word. Clarifies his word. It's already written. So if somebody comes to you and says, I'm a prophet and God has given me some divine pizza dream and this is what you're supposed to follow and it doesn't line up with his word, guess what? He or she is wrong. Wrong. Non-debatable if it does not line up with the word. This is why it's important to read your Bibles. That's why it's important to be in the scripture every day so we can sort these things out as followers of Jesus. Now, David Hill in his book, The New Testament Comment or New Testament Prophecy, I found very helpful. And this is what he says. New Testament prophecy therefore includes both conventional preaching, when the preacher has the sense of being gripped and convicted by the Spirit about his or her message and more spontaneous, unpremeditated utterances. The Christian prophets are those who have grasped the meaning of, that's key, grasped the meaning of Scripture, perceived its powerful relevance to the life of the individual, to the church and society, and then declares that message fearlessly. Much different than someone on the street corner talking to you about some dream they had that doesn't line up with Scripture. Sells books, but if it doesn't line up with the text of Scripture, don't buy the book. I mean, you can. I'm not the boss. If you get a wood stove, it'll help heat the house. Their prophecy, Craig Bloomberg states, is not on par with Scripture. And their exercise of the gift, like that of all other spiritual gifts, is subject to error and misrepresentation. This is why we have to be very careful. 
Now, I know I make jokes, but as a pastor, I take this very seriously in trying to sort these things out. Because when I have people come to me and they talk about being an apostle and being a prophet, we really have to ask the question of what do you mean by that? Are you telling me that you're gifted in a particular way and what is the proof and evidence of that? What is the outworking of the gift that God has given to you? How is that reinforcing what the scripture says? Who's getting glory here? Who's being edified through what is being said by you? That's why when somebody, there's many people in this church, at least three that I can count, if not more, who have a very strong prophetic gifting. And they tend to get a word nine times out of ten, they don't understand it. Guess where they come? My office. Am I helpful? Not usually. (laughs) But we are very prayerful because I have to pastor that gift because that's also what the scripture says. So I have to work through that. We sit back and we say, okay, Lord, what are you trying to say here? Does it line up with the text of Scripture? Does it apply to the person that's speaking it? Does it apply to somebody else? Does it apply to the church? The hard work of sorting the gifts out is so imperative. This is one of the reasons why we don't stone anybody anymore when they stand up and go, thus saith the Lord. We simply ignore them. (laughs) Unless it lines up with Scripture. These giftings are absolutely for today. Don't misunderstand me. But we have to make sure that we're using them and applying them in the right way. Otherwise, the church gets very weird and not in a good biblical way. Christians are weird. I'm weird. And that's a good thing. But when we misuse these, it's just very unsettling. We need to understand the prophetic gifting in this way that it functions to edify the body to clarify the already written scriptures to the glory of God. So those are good questions that you want to ask yourself. Is this what's going on in my mind and in my life? And do I have someone that I can talk to when I'm confused? Because both of those, the apostolic gifting and the prophetic gifting, are very difficult for people who are gifted in that way. When we understand this, the gifts become actually less about ego, pride, and the bizarre desire to start our own traveling ministry show. We understand the weight that God has placed upon us if we are gifted in that way. They're then seen as they should be in light of how it serves the community of believers, how it brings glory to God. We see a pattern here. It's a bone I like to chew on. Glorify God. Edify the body. Glorify God, edify the body. Ad nauseum, you'll get sick of me saying it, but that's the purpose of the gifts. So we're on to the next group. Third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing. It's a fun week. Those who are teachers, the Bible tells us, are again, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, they're pastors primarily. That's what the Bible tells us. As well as those who've been called to be a part of the teaching community among a local congregation. Okay, 1 Timothy 5.17 talks about that. I leave that with you to look up. But you have teaching elders. Claude has taught here in the past. Parks has taught here in the past. Those are teaching elders. They have the ability to be able to teach, put a message together, and stand behind the pulpit. It's one of the things that you look for. Not in every elder, but in some of the elders, that is one of the things that they do. We then have other pastors, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Lisa Marie, Pastor Marty, all who've been called to preach and to teach. He makes this clear, Paul does in the letter to Timothy, that elders ought to be able to at some level teach. Because we are responsible along with the pastor for the spiritual well-being of the congregation. Now I know that that's hard sometimes for us to really get our hands around, but that is what we are called to. Responsible as much as it depends upon me for your spiritual well being. Take very seriously the call that God has placed upon my life as much as any of you take the call of God on your life seriously. It doesn't mean that no one else is gifted in teaching. It just simply means that I have been set aside for a certain thing. It doesn't mean that we don't let anyone else teach. It just means that we have to make sure we're examining what they're teaching so that it is solid biblical teaching for the people that are under our care. Is it dictatorial? Some would think so. I don't. I think it's actually safe. Is it arrogant? 
Maybe. Depends on how you handle it. Is it controlling? I don't think so. It's God's command. It's biblical. It's what he tells us. We are to do it with all humility, understanding that I am accountable for everything that I say that comes out of this pulpit. It doesn't just go off into the air and then I can just laugh about it and move on. That's why humility is essential because teachers are held to such a high standard. James, the brother of Jesus, would not even call himself that. He said, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. Our duty, again, as I said, as much as it depends upon me and everybody else before God is to ensure good teaching in the form of sound biblical doctrine and doing our best to unpack the text of Scripture. Doing so in a way that doesn't put every one of you in some sort of semi-comatose state by 9.45 or 10.45 and I'm just looking at nostrils on a Sunday morning. We have to make the Word of God say what it says and He will bring it to life accordingly. Now, when we look at miracles and we look at healing, when I see this in, in trying to understand this, I think it's helpful to do so in the light of the word that Paul uses at the very end, one of the gifts that he gives us in light of miracles and healing, and that's helping. Helping. Helping people is actually a gift of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Helping people is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It says so right in the text of Scripture. God does work miracles, and God can divinely heal. I have seen it. I've seen it throughout my Christian life, but that's not the normative way that he functions. It really isn't. If it were, it would no longer be a miracle, would it? It would just be normal. People raising from the dead, that'd just be an everyday occurrence. It's Tuesday, and six people rose out of the tomb. That's just what we see on a Tuesday. That's not how it works. It wouldn't be a miracle that way, would it? But God does work miracles even still today. He does so through gifted people who help. Gifted people who help. He heals also in the same way. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. The medical sciences and community, the doctors and the nurses, the EMTs, the first responders, all of those people who handle those things come to mind in a very practical sense. We can sit on the end of our bed and pray for Jesus to come and heal us from whatever ails us. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you go to a hospital eight blocks away with a doctor who's got a 12-year degree and a nurse who's got a six-year degree or a four-year degree, you might want to start there. That's where we look, say, God, there's a miracle there. There can be healing to be had there. I know that you can just, in a touch, you can take away that cancer that's in me. I know that you can do that. But you see, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. We can then begin to believe and understand that the miracle and the healing that God provides sometimes for us shows up wearing scrubs. And it's important that we do not pitch the sciences for hyper-faith. Be very careful not to do that. Where you pitch out every brilliant thing that scientists and the medical community give us because I just have faith. Faith without works is what? Get in your car, drive to the hospital. There's your work. Have faith that when you get there, someone's going to fix what ails you. I'm not making light of it. God can do what he wants, but let's start with the intensely practical. It is no less of a miracle, nor is it any less of a healing. God can simply heal. He can miraculously fix somebody just like that. It happens. Is that what he does all the time? No, it's not. Be wary of those who tell you that your faith is weak. Be wary of those who tell you that your belief is just simply not strong enough and that's why you're suffering or the loved one you've been praying for is still suffering. 70-something percent of this universe is made up of something they call black matter. We can't see it, but we know it exists and we know it helps to keep everything hanging together. I have faith in that. How can I not have enough faith for God to move mountains if he so chooses? But if somebody tells you that your faith isn't strong enough and that's why you're sick, there's nothing in the Bible that confirms that. Don't believe it. 
Those types of people are very self-serving and they offer lies and they offer false hope to hurting people who want an answer in that way. And I am very adamant about that. I have sat in my office far too many times with people who have stopped taking medication that have been given to them by a doctor to help them with the diseases that they have because somebody convinced them that their faith just wasn't strong enough. Throw all that medicine out. Don't do that. Have faith, but understand that God brings miracles and healing in so many different ways besides just raising Lazarus from the dead. Thus the word helper. Thus the gift of helping. It's very similar to Romans 12, 8, actually, where he talks about acts of mercy. Makes good sense, doesn't it? Acts of mercy. It implies that there are those who actually minister to both the spiritual and the physical need within the community of believers. It's essential. So being a helper is absolutely critical. Now Paul now closes this list with a surprising gift and then a troublesome one. So for those of you who are wondering if I'm ever going to end, I'm close. Verse 28, administrating in various kinds of tongues. See, there's the surprising gift and the troublesome one. Because i got to ask the question for myself, what's up with the administration piece? After all, what happens here on a Sunday morning, for those of us who grew up in that way, understand that church just happens on Sunday. We just show up and kaboom. It's all just wonderful, isn't it? And we just end on time and start on time and everything's in tune. Mm. Any kind of planning and preparation in that perspective stifles the Holy Spirit, some people would think. See, but preparation honors God. And God honors preparation. I don't want to go into any battle with one sneaker on, hoping I can get to the other side. I'm going to be the idiot that they leave behind. It just is what it is. Administration is absolutely important. See, Paul puts this here because it needs to be here. And he does so in part because of what we find in verse 40 in chapter 14. All things should be done decently and in order. In order. You see, the Corinthian church had a major problem with Sunday morning chaos. That's part of the reason why he's writing this letter. The Holy Spirit can and he does move on Sundays any way he wants. And he does so more often in ways which don't look like a giant circus and free-for-all. Where we open up the altar and we weaponize banners and for six hours we say the same four words until we just decide that we're done. These are not insults. These are things I have learned over the years to recognize when we get in the way of what God is doing. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just trying to say, look it. There is a way in which we do things. Administration is absolutely essential. Chaos and foolishness do not glorify God, nor do they edify the body of believers. Rather, the self is satisfied all along the way. And sadly, it does nothing for an unbeliever who shows up on Sunday morning or a seeker coming in here trying to figure out what's going on and we are just all over the board and the word isn't preached, Jesus isn't glorified, the body's not edified, and they turn around and they walk out. What kind of gospel is that? Where's the gospel in that, actually? It's not. If we want to reach an unbeliever, we got to make sure that what we're doing and saying is incredibly clear. The church needs to be run well. I know that sounds very Baptist of me. (laughs) But the church needs to be run well. It needs to be seen in the wider community as doing so and being a good representative of Jesus and what we do and what we say and how we treat other human beings. It's essential. Creating a healthy culture both within the church and within our community at large. That's what we're called to do. Good administration is a gift from God anywhere it is applied. It's a boring gift. That's why Rachel takes care of all of my stuff. (laughs) Because I don't know where I'm supposed to be on Tuesday if it's not in my calendar. Ask her. She'll tell you. It's an essential gift Not one that everybody wants to run up the flagpole. Perhaps we could use more of it. 
Add that together with a little bit of a contrite heart, a smattering of civility with all levels of society, government, and in the church as well, perhaps, just perhaps, we might see a little bit more of the love of Christ and a little bit less of the snarky attitude. Important. Perhaps, and rightly so, the church should lead the way in humility. Perhaps we should choose the side of Christ instead of an aisle which suits our desires to have all of our rights and demands met. But before I get fired, we'll move on. (laughs) Various kinds of tongues. This is the one that when we talk about gifts, everybody goes to, just like the Corinthian church did. When we look at this, we need to understand. Oh, boy. We have to understand that it is the same in function as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't have the same purpose. Same in function, not the same purpose. Paul is dealing with the gift here. He's not dealing with the baptism. And we are going to run just a, a bit late, and I'm sorry, but I think that this is absolutely essential. Paul is dealing with the gift here, not the baptism. And I say that for this reason. Because the gift is with interpretation for the edification of this body. That's what the Bible tells us. Again, it's the same in function, how it works, but it is different in purpose, why it is given. So look with me at Acts 2, verse 8 and and verse 11. When the baptism came, Luke records for us that the people that were gathered there from all over the known world said, how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Okay? So the purpose and the function of the baptism is for the power to witness. The tongues themselves were given as the initial physical evidence of that baptism And it did just that. There was no need for interpretation on the day of Pentecost. They hear, that's a miracle actually, they hear of God's mighty works in their own language. So there's something going on there that's beyond our understanding. And this is very helpful for us as we look at 1 Corinthians because tongues as a gift, again, same in function, it could perhaps sound the same, it has a different purpose. And we have to see and understand that it actually needs interpretation in order to be useful. So if somebody launches a tongue in here on a Sunday morning and there's no interpretation for it, probably shouldn't have happened. We don't like that, but it probably shouldn't have happened. Bloomberg says, speaking in tongues must not be confused with what happened to the disciples at Pentecost. There the audience understood without the benefit of an interpreter. Here, in 1 Corinthians, interpretation is required. It's helpful for us as we look at Paul's closing string of questions with the anticipated answer to every one of them is no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? That's where the Pentecostal goes, wait a minute. I can say that because I am one. Oh, perhaps. No. Paul's not looking for a perhaps. He's looking for a no. Do all interpret? No. So we have to understand that's the direction that Paul was going. I think I'll close with this as the worship team comes up, please. And the reason why I went very slowly in that, at least in my mind I did, (laughs) perhaps not. Um, I have sat down and I have counseled with people over the years as a senior pastor. And I have had people in my office in tears. Having been saved in a believer in Jesus and walking out that life for years, with tears pouring down their face, believing that they don't have the Holy Spirit because they haven't spoken tongues. That God didn't give them the Holy Spirit even though they are in a relationship with Jesus because they haven't spoken in tongues. There couldn't be a more unbiblical teaching and belief. Luke 11 tells us that the minute we receive Christ, we are filled. John tells us that in 20. Luke 24 tells us that we are filled. John 20 goes so far as to say that Jesus breathed on them. I've also had people tell me that if they don't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that you just can't do anything at all for Christ. 
Both of these lines of thinking are wrong when it comes to tongues. We either believe wrongly about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mostly because of the use and abuse of tongues, frankly, that's just been my study, or prophecy, or they're afraid to even approach the gifts because we're afraid we might misuse them. The goal for every Christian is maturity. That's what the goal is. Ultimately, the prime goal for us as we get ready to close here in song is the maturing of your Christian walk as an individual in order that the body be blessed, in order that God be glorified. None of us are perfect. Every one of us will make a mistake. Not one of us is going to hit the mark every day. And if you are operating in the gifts, you're probably going to stumble here and there, and that's okay. We're growing into excellence by working out our salvation with fear and trembling. One last thought. Get into the Word. Open up a Bible. And even if it's one verse a day, ask the Lord to reveal to you what He's saying in that one verse. You don't need to start by learning the whole Bible if you haven't ever opened it. But start somewhere, even with just a verse. God will work with you, in you, and through you at that moment in time. And then you grow in Him in that way. Let's all stand.